Welcome to your premier news source about what's going on in my backyard. I'm Laura Bean, and this is PNN, Plant News Network. Our lead story today concerns this interesting interaction between a monarch butterfly and a hummingbird who seems baffled at this creature. The monarch can be seen swirling around some milkweed plants, hopefully to lay some eggs. The hummingbird approaches and investigates. And as the monarch flies higher, the hummingbird seems curious and baffled by this strange, bright, flying flower. If you think about it, they both each have about the same wingspan. We attract hummingbirds to our house with this First Nature brand feeder. I think it's really good. It's a wide mouth jar with a feeder attachment on the bottom. It's three pieces total. It's really easy to clean. I clean it once a week and I refill it with a sugar solution, four to one water to sugar, boil it and let it cool. And that fills both of the two hummingbird feeders that we have. Now it's time for a pollinator profile. Have you ever seen these small semicircular pieces cut from the edges of the leaves of native plants? This is the work of a small solitary bee called the leaf cutter bee. It's black and white striped and fuzzy. This small bee cuts out pieces of leaves to use as lining for its tubular nest. It nests in wooden tubes or hollows and uses leaf bits to line the nest and make it more comfortable. The leafcutter bee is actually a really good pollinator. One study said that 150 leafcutter bees pollinate as many plants as 3,000 honeybees. It's the last week of July. Let's take a look at what's blooming now. We've got some beautiful white phlox. There's a coneflower, a favorite, although not a native, contrary to popular belief. And here's a beautiful native Michigan sunflower called Helianthus strumosa. Helianthus is a plant that creates large colonies like this one through underground runners. It's also an allopathic plant. That means that the plant produces toxins that inhibit other plants from growing nearby. Time for our DIY moment. Let's talk about seed saving. Here's my delphinium. You can see the small pods, which are full of tiny pepper-like seeds. They can be collected now. Milkweed is becoming ripe as well, though it won't be ready for some time. This is regular milkweed, and this is swamp milkweed. It produces long, slender pods. There are a couple of different types of rudbeckia, whose seed I'm saving this year. This first one is a sport or a genetic random mutation that I found among my Rudbeckia plants. This is a double ringed Rudbeckia. It's interesting because you can see that other blooms on the same plant have single rosa petals, but that one on the top has a double. Now you can see where I've marked it with a tag. This is a common tree tag. I bought a whole bunch off of eBay for a few dollars, and it helps me identify which plants I want to save seeds from in the fall when they're really difficult to distinguish. Here's another plant, Rudbeckia triloba. It's a different species of Rudbeckia. This triloba is a volunteer in the yard. I'm not sure how it got here, but anyway, it's a very cute plant and you can see that I've marked it as well to save its seeds in the fall. The top of this plant is already turning brown. Here's what one of my Rudbeckia looked like in June, a beautiful red heart Rudbeckia. And I've marked it with a white tree tag. Today, in the last week of July, here's what it looks like. It's already turned brown. You can see it's indistinguishable from the other Rudbeckia next to it. The mark shows me that this is the one whose seed I want to save. So that's a really helpful little tool to help you identify which seeds to save. I also use these tree tags to mark seedlings. I allow the tree tag to remain on the seedling throughout the winter because in the spring, sometimes my over-enthusiastic weeding means that I rip up, uh, you know, a number of plants that I carefully planted last season, and I don't want to do that. So you can see this Ratiba pinata kind of coneflower has been marked with a tree tag. So next spring, when some strange seedling comes up, I'll be able to recognize it. 
This is also the time of year when you can start thinking about fall crops like chard. Here's some chard that I planted in pots at the beginning of this month and you can see that they're growing up and will be ready to transplant fairly soon so that we can have a nice fall crop into the late fall of fresh chard. Fall is also a good time to plant perennials. Here are some native milkweed seeds from the milkweeds in my yard last year that I planted and gr have grown these are getting bigger and um, maybe a little too big for their pots right now, but I'm not going to transplant them now because I'm going to wait for another month and a half or so and then transplant them in the ground at the spot that I prefer, probably around mid-September, late September, early October, something like that. So they'll get a head start to grow next year. I'd like to leave you with a point to ponder. This is a quote from the great Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus. This is how he described a small subarctic little pink flower called Linnea. Quote, Linnea, a plant of Lapland, lowly, insignificant, disregarded, flowering, but for a brief space, like Linnaeus, who resembles it. Unquote. Thank you so much for tuning in, and see you next time on PNN. Plant News Network.